Hi guys, welcome to another episode of U.S. History with Linux, and today we're headed into the Roaring Twenties. That's right, America's coming out of World War I and moving into a new decade where we're going to rediscover who we are. Now in this particular video, we're going to talk about the politics, taxes, and foreign policy of our American government. Coming out of the war, America wanted to be selfish. We wanted to get back to some of our isolationist ideals and focus more on ourselves and not what's going on in the world. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to explain the similarities and differences that the Americans had with regards to their view of themselves as well as the world. So let's get started. Understand first that during the 1920s, the Republicans dominated government. They had control of both the executive and legislative branch, and they had a specific platform in mind for the 1920s. Domestically, they wanted to cut taxes as well as put an umbrella of protection over our industry. So they'll start issuing a lot of new tariffs. They're also going to promote this idea of Americanism, this idea of American values first. Again, like I said earlier, it's going to be a selfish time for America. With regards to our relationship in the world, well, we want to remain isolated from the drama and the entanglements of Europe. However, we also feel like we have a role in the world and we start pushing the idea of disarmament and control of the militaries throughout the world. The presidents of the 1920s start with Warren G. Harding from Ohio. He promises a return to normalcy for the American people when he says America's present need is not heroics, but healing, not nostrums, but normalcy, not revolution, but restoration, and not submersion in internationality, but sustainment in triumphant nationality. Focus on America first. Now, this return to normalcy is going to include a domestic policy that includes quota acts on immigration, as well as tariffs, such as the Fortney McCumber tariff. With regards to foreign policy, we're going to be a key player in the Washington Naval Conference, which deals with that disarmament that I spoke to earlier. But Harding's going to have some problems in his administration, some scandals, including the Teapot Dome scandal. Harding's administration, though, will be short-lived as he dies in office and Calvin Coolidge will step in and take over the presidency. Coolidge is going to be another Republican from the state of Vermont, and he is going to serve out the rest of Harding's term plus another. His, his entire platform is based on boosting American business. He's quoted as saying, the business of the American people is business. He brought us through a time period known as Coolidge Prosperity, where Americans experienced low taxes, balanced budgets, and a robust economy. But unfortunately, that economy is going to falter under Herbert Hoover. The extreme spending and lifestyles of Americans during the 20s is going to catch up with us, and Hoover, as he comes into the presidency, will have to deal with the Great Depression when the stock market crashes in 1929 but we'll get to that eventually. He's going to push the idea of our American system where we have a small government. He believed with regards to business, we should regulate, but not interfere. He wanted to take low risk with regards to our government, especially due to the fact that we were using taxpayer money. And Hoover believed in equality of opportunity. Everyone should have the same opportunity to succeed, but it's up to the individual to do that. Going back to Harding's presidency, he's going to push this idea of Americanism. He said, call it the selfishness of nationality, if you will. I think it's an inspiration to patriotic devotion, to safeguard America first, to stabilize America first, to prosper America first, and to think of America first. Let the internationalist dream and the Bolshevists destroy. We proclaim Americanism. And this idea is what's going to be carrying us through this decade, this idea of America first. When we look at Harding's presidency, he lives and dies by his cabinet. Harding's cabinet is a story of the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
The good will be Andrew Mellon, his Secretary of Treasury, who's going to introduce tax cuts to the American people. In doing so, this is going to drive production numbers up and drive the national debt down. The bad, though, Harding's going to surround himself with a bunch of his buddies from Ohio, nicknamed the Ohio Gang, and he will appoint them to different positions that they're going to use for their own economic gain. Probably the biggest example of this is going to be the ugly of Harding's administration, known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior, and he's an anti-conservationist. What he's going to do is accept bribes from oil companies in order to extend them leases of federal land that was protected so they could go in and drill for oil. One location that this took place in is in Wyoming at the Teapot Dome. If you look at that rock feature on the right, it's referred to as the Teapot Dome because from a distance, it looks like a teapot. Albert Fall is actually going to be convicted of accepting bribes and he will go to prison for his activities, but it leaves a very ugly stain on Harding's administration. He's also going to push the idea of protectionism, protecting American industry. Republicans are going back towards these pro-business policies and one of those policies is tariffs. The Fortney McCumber tariff introduced by Joseph Fortney of Michigan and Porter McCumber of North Dakota is going to raise tariffs on imports to nearly 38.5%. The problem with that, while it does encourage others to buy American goods, it also encourages European countries to start instituting tariffs of their own. And what this will do is slow down international trade. And over time, this will slow down the production numbers in America. Harding will die in the midst of his administration, just fell asleep one night, never woke up, and his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, will take over. Now, Coolidge is going to maintain pro-business policies that Harding instituted. And when he runs for re-election in 1924, he's easily going to be re-elected. He said, I want the people of America to be able to work less for the government and more for themselves. I want them to have the rewards of industry. This is the meaning of freedom. Until we can reestablish a condition under which the earnings of the people can be kept by the people, we are bound to suffer severe and distinct curtailment of liberty. Calvin Coolidge, like Harding, believed in low taxes, believed in allowing the American people to hold on to the money they earned. And this is why people backed him up so much. People love to hold on to their money. But not everybody was happy and not everyone was prospering during the 1920s. The farmers and the unions were specifically hit hard. The Red Scare and the Palmer Raids, which we'll talk about in a future video, is going to turn the public against the unions. And we're going to see union membership decline in the 1920s. This is just going to give a boost to the capitalists once again. Farmers, on the other hand, faced difficulty coming out of World War I because demand for their products dropped. No longer are they providing food for soldiers overseas and people at home. On top of that, new technology is once again their enemy. The technology is going to drive up production, and the more supply you have, the lower the prices are. Now, there were those in government who tried to protect the farmers with the McNerney Haugen bill. The idea behind it was the government would purchase the farm goods in order to drive the price up. However, it went in front of President Coolidge twice and twice he vetoed it. When we look at the foreign policy of the 1920s, remember we had that American first ideology. However, we were still seen as a world leader and we're gonna play a key role in several major decisions with regards to relationships within the world. Keep in mind, we did not join the League of Nations, but we are still a player on the world stage. I think the first example of this is going to be the Washington Naval Conference during Harding's administration. This is an international arms control conference that was held here in Washington, D.C. from 1921 to 22. Nine nations are going to attend, and the sole purpose of this conference is to promote peace, especially in the Pacific, as well as reduce defense expenditures of all countries. Now, the Washington Naval Conference will be successful in maintaining peace during the 1920s. But when the hostility started to grow because of the Great Depression, none of it will be renewed. But several key treaties were signed during this conference. 
First of all, the Five Power Treaty is going to be signed between the countries of the United States, Great Britain, Japan, France, and Italy. And what this basically did was set ratios for battleships, primarily the size of battleships. Battleships were the key component of naval forces. And what the Five Power Treaty did was it limited the size of battleships based on the size of a nation. A ratio was set up between these five countries and each of them agreed to abide by that ratio. In fact, naval vessels in the United States were actually destroyed under the Five Power Treaty. The Four Power Treaty is going to include the United States, France, Great Britain, and Japan. And the idea behind that is simply that each would respect the other's territory in the Pacific. And then finally, the Nine Power Treaty, signed by all members of the conference, where they agreed to respect the open door policy in China, as well as respect China's sovereignty. The door had been reopened in China. The kellogg brian Pact started off as a discussion between the United States and France and then spread to the rest of the world. What it did was it, it renounced war as an instrument of national policy, making war illegal, if you will. Now, it was signed in 1928, originally by the United States, France, and Germany, and it stated that war could never be used to resolve any disputes or conflicts between countries. After these three countries signed, 37 more countries will sign the pact as well. The problem is, how do you enforce this? Because defensive wars were allowed. And who's going to stop you if you go to war? There was no enforcement policy because this was done outside of the League of Nations. It really was a paper tiger. It looked fierce, but it had no power. Finally, let's talk about the Dawes Plan. Now, don't confuse this with the Dawes Act of the 1800s. The Dawes Plan was set up after World War I when the United States basically became a creditor nation. We were in a situation where large amounts of money were loaned to Europe to rebuild, but they were unable to pay us back, and primarily because Germany was not able to pay its reparations that had been set up in the Treaty of Versailles. We were also experiencing that weak international trade due to tariffs. And so the United States was seeing loans not being paid. So what they did was they instituted the Dawes Plan. And what that did is it provided an opportunity for Germany to make payments to England and France, who would in turn repay the war debt to us. Simply put, American banks are going to loan money to Germany. Germany will use this money to start rebuilding as well as start paying the reparations from World War I. Those reparation payments going to England and France will allow those two countries to start rebuilding and pay back the United States for their war loans. Now, this will continue through the 20s. However, with the stock market crash of 1929, it's going to come to an end. The idea was America was funding its own repayment plan, but now they're receiving interest from both England and France as well as Germany. So that's about it for politics during the 1920s. Remember, it was primarily Republican control and Republican decisions that were being made, and they were being made on the basis that America needed to be selfish coming out of World War I. Hopefully you picked up a little bit more information if you enjoyed what you saw, go ahead and give me a like or two. And as always, I'd appreciate a subscribe. But we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.